Okay, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Um, such a big crowd in here. I mean, we, we had our last uh, meeting of the YPN in December, but I mean, I don't think I've ever seen uh, a crowd this size. I was beginning to wonder uh, when I sent out the invitation, Bertie, for this event, and it filled up in two days where we had a, an IAA meeting or a, a 2005 uh, Fianna Fáil Ardesh, but it certainly, uh, certainly looks like a Fianna Fáil Ardesh in here this evening. But um, thank you so much to, to everyone who's come. Um, I sent out the invitation to, to Bertie for this event here tonight because uh, I read a poll uh, in the Sunday Times in November uh, which said that 50% of young people, so those people between the ages of uh, 18 to 24, uh, felt that they did not fully understand the history of the Troubles, um, which struck me as, as quite a large figure um, and something that I think is very important for us as young people to uh, not only remember what happened, but also that we don't forget what happened. Um, and discussions like these here this evening uh, and other discussions that are taking place as part of the commemorations, I think are very important in achieving that. Um, the Good Friday Agreement, which was negotiated in 1998, the 10th of April, 1998, uh, marked the beginning of a lasting peace uh, in Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, it was negotiated by Bertie Ahern on behalf of the Irish government, uh, Tony Blair on behalf of the British government, and the eight political parties in, in Northern Ireland who participated in the talks. Um, and without which I, I think many uh, thousands of people may not be here today. So it's important uh, to mark the discussion and to do it uh, respectfully here today as well. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so Bertie's gonna speak to us for approximately 15 minutes, uh, after which time we'll go to discussion and Q&A with the audience. Uh, for those of you in person, if you'd like to take part in the discussion, please feel free to raise your hand and I'll come to you throughout the discussion. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, uh, maybe just, just first of all to say, I'm sorry that you can't be here this evening. Um, sorry, uh, sorry that you can't be here this evening, uh, just in light of the, the capacity issues here today, uh, but I hope that we'll be able to, to welcome you to another discussion in the future. So um, for any of you who'd like to contribute to the discussion as well, uh, please feel free to participate on Twitter using the hashtag at IIEA. Um, so without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce Bertie and then we get started. Um, Bertie Ahern, who I'm sure you all know, um, served as Taoiseach of Ireland from 1997 to 2008, uh, leading Fianna Fáil into government on three successive occasions in 1997, 2002 and 2007. Amongst other roles, he previously served as a Taunashta or Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland, Minister for Finance, Minister for Labour, Minister for Industry and Commerce, Minister for Arts, Culture and the Gwaeltacht, and the Lord Mayor of Dublin. And he was a Choctadola for Dublin Central from 1977 to 2011. So I guess you could say Bertie is welcoming us here today in Dublin Central, uh, given this was his old uh, stomach ground. So without further ado, Bertie, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Chairman and Director General Alex White. Uh, it's great to be here again. I've been always fond memories of this building. We've had so many debates and discussions, usually about uh, European constitutional issues and from the European Constitution, the various referenda uh, over the years. Um, Chairman has given me the task of giving uh, 800 years of history in 15 minutes. So uh, uh, I, we'll skip the first 750 and, uh, and we'll try and bring it down to more modern times. I suppose <laughs> to talk about the troubles and, you know, we, we wanted tonight try and move it on from the the troubles into where we are now and hopefully where we'll be as as you all move through your various careers uh, successfully um, and, and see how the change in Ireland works. But I suppose it, it's it's worth saying there's a lot of debate and it's not, I think, just young people internationally, there's huge interest uh, in, in the Irish peace process um, because I suppose a lot of peace processes haven't really worked um, I think our one has partially worked. Uh, the peace has ended up very successfully. The political side, as you see, jitters on um, continually. But it, it, a lot of people think that this started the troubles was mainly around uh, the United Ireland, around the border. It, it wasn't that at all. I mean, what happened was there had been a, an IRA campaign. I'm going to move quickly through this period because it's 15 minutes. But there'd been an IRA campaign on 56 to 62. That campaign was mainly a campaign um, by by Southern people, mainly those of you who listened to Ballas or Sean South or Gary Owen, who's who from Limerick, 
Uh, so it tended to be a, um, a southern group fighting on the border. And, uh, and that, when that ended up, the Republican movement were moving into really what should they be doing. And Sinn Féin, who were down the road in those days, were deciding where they where they should go and what should they should do. There was some lawless violence in 65, 66, 67. But the troubles really came out of um, the civil rights movement in the North, which had nothing to do with United Ireland uh, or a border poll or anything else. Uh, it was based on what was going on in America and, and France at the time, mainly in Paris, around equality uh, and uh, around fairness in society. And the issues in the North were housing, because it was total discrimination against nationalists. Uh, it, it was um, around the gerrymandering of constituencies, probably best described of, of how it worked in Derry, where there were six constituencies. Um, the nationalists had a majority in five, so they were all pushed into one, and the union is in majority in Derry. Uh, it was good if you can get away with it. And um, th that that lasted for, for only a, uh, a short while. And uh, people like John Hume and... Austin Curry and Eddie McGrady and Paddy Devlin, the people who formed it, uh, the SDLP, were all really fighting, you know, labor and, and social lines. Uh, and it was only the reaction of the storm and administration, unionist dominated, uh, who'd almost got separated from the rest of the United Kingdom. And they used physical force against the civil rights movement, against uh, predominantly nationalists who were fighting these, but not only nationalists, uh, and that embittered people. The Republican movement was was weak at the time, which was the o official uh, Sinn Féin, as as it became known afterwards. Um, they they splintered, and the IRA went into the official IRA and provisional IRA, and then the trouble started. But it it didn't grow out of that. It grew out of the civil rights movement. The seventies were just a nightmare, huge amount of people killed, bombing. Um, you know, you know the, the stats, I mean, 3,721 people died in, in the troubles, about 28,000 people were seriously injured. Um, and if you add in shootings and bombs, it was about 50,000, it was a few billion pounds worth of damage. So it, it, it followed the track from the 70s and it just got worse every year. The figures, if you look back at them now, were horrendous in, in the early 70s. Um, and it was one effort to, to try and bring some solution around 1974, Sunningdale. Uh, that failed because the uh, Protestant Ulster Workers' Strike brought down the regime. 300,000 people went to strike, and Hurt and Harden isn't a big place, so they brought down the, the whole place. Then we moved on into the 80s. Uh, the 80s was the hunger strike, um, where the Republican movement got very strong in the North, and the IRA got very strong in the, uh, in the North. Uh, the IRA, provisional IRA had 400 members in Derry at one stage at, at, the, at the height of the, of the troubles. Um, and then there was another attempt made in 1985, the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Uh, I take nothing from the people that were involved, either from the Irish government or British government. They worked really hard in those two agreements in 74 and Sunningdale and 85. Um, unfortunately, both of them collapsed. Um, not always for the same reason, but... Uh, it, it, they, they collapsed and we might come back to that if, if you're interested later. Um, then we went through the rest of the 80s. After the end of Skill and Bombing, where the IRA uh, blew up the Senate panel stop in, in, in Enniskill and, and there was a horrendous case, uh, not too many of us in the room would remember that, you and I do, Alex, but uh, where, you know, there was a, a father um, and he was lying in the rubble and holding the hand of his daughter who was a nurse and he relayed an RTE and several programs afterwards, just the last moments. And it, it had a huge it had a huge effect on the population, uh, north and south, because people said this is just horrendous. And it was a it was a human story. And it, you know, if you ever listen back to some of those interviews on YouTube, or um, you, you just realize how horrendous it was. That led the IRA to start to wonder: was there another way of doing things? And what promoted that was the Redemptorist Order in Clonard in Belfast. Uh, Father Jerry Reynolds and Father Alex Reed, two priests, um, started reaching out to the IRA. They knew who they were, um, and they started reaching out to, to other groups as well. And that started off um, the, the peace process. Moving quickly into the 90s, in 91, 92, 
uh, there was uh, all party talks excluding Sinn Féin. Um, that didn't solve a lot, but what it did was it at least got the parties in the North to say what they were in favour of rather than what they're against. Parties in Northern Ireland are absolutely Olympic gold medalists when it comes to saying what they're against. Um, they're, not, they're not quite as, as um, Flahulik has explained what they're, what they're for, but that 91-92 effort did that. Um, that was used as the basis by Albert Reynolds in 93. Uh, to bring people together to see if they could put in one document what the aspirations of everybody was and to see if there was a peaceful means how you could do that. Um, the, it's always worth to read, I think, of the Downsea Declaration uh, for two reasons. One, it's a masterpiece. A lot of people, there were about 40 people involved in, in and they were from Catholic, Protestant and the centre uh, involved in that document. But it, it's chairman, it's very useful because it's very short. You read it in 10 minutes. Um, and that formed the basis for the IRA ceasefire in August 94 and for the Lila ceasefire in October 1994. Went into 95, it was a bad year because the British, as they, they tend to do, um, kicked the ball over the bar instead of into the net. Uh, and they, they started saying, well, Sinn Féin can't get into the talks um, unless there's decommissioning of arms, which was a lost cause at the time. Uh, so... In 95, there was this thing called Washington Tree, which was agreed by Sir Patrick May, who, who was Secretary of State. Um, we fell a bit into the trap of uh, agreeing to that at the time, which we shouldn't have. And then we went into 96, the ceasefires broke down. Um, and then um, nothing happened in 96. Uh, there, was, there was, well, there was Canary Wharf, caused three billion worth of damage in the centre of London and a half a billion in, in bombing in, in, in Manchester. Huge, huge, huge damage. Also, deaths again happened. Not a huge amount, but in in the north. So, and um, that brings us to ninety seven, where uh, the change of administrations. Uh, Tony Blair and I had been working in ninety five and ninety six, saying that if we were in government, um, what what we could do and how we would challenge it. And the plan was fairly simple: one that he would have to reassure unionists, uh, because there had been a labour. The Labour had been out of government for 16 years. Had been Thatcher and Major. Uh, Major was a good guy, but he, he had very little power. He, he was hamstrung by uh, needing support um, from, from both right-wing unionists and right-wing conservatives, and he, he just wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. So um, Tony Blair, it was clear he was going to get a very big mandate at that time. It wasn't so clear I was going to get, because our electorate system was always going to be tight. Uh, so we said, he assures the union as I try and convince the Sinn Féin to convince the IRA to get back. Um, a big part of that was, again, was Father Alex Reid and the Redemptorists. They, they played a huge uh, part in a lot of that. We had all kind of back channels, all kind of secret negotiations going on to try and... Anyway, we got there. And then in September, the deal was that if we got that done, we'd get Sinn Féin into the talks for the very first time. Sinn Féin had never been involved in the previous talks, in any of them, 74, 85, 91, 92. So at that stage, um, they were into the talks. Um, the reason you often hear me on the radio defending the unions and David Trimble, and it's for this reason, which isn't always understood, when the talks started in September uh, of 1997, um, it, once we said Sinn Féin were coming in, the DUP walked out and so did the UK union, a small part, but a very vocal, vocal people. And they had a lot of legal people uh, who were very good at uh, starting the, the muck uh, and, and causing major confusion. So um, it, once they walked out, it was thought that David Trimble would also walk out, but he didn't. Um, and we convinced the two loyalist parties, Davy Irvine, PUP, Michael um uh, uh no, 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 the UDP, mm, Gary McMichael, Gary McMichael of UDP, uh, to, to stay in the talk. So uh once that happened, it gave David Trimble cover and David Trimble stayed in the talks to his eternal credit, because if he went out that time, there, there was going to be no no run into the Good Friday Agreement. So between September 97 and uh, Easter 98. Um, that's where the Good Friday Agreement was born. That's where the talks took place. Huge range of issues. And I'll just 
I mentioned them all in, 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 in one block. One, there was setting up the institutions, the executive, uh, uh, set, setting up the assembly in the north, the north-south bodies, which was the Irish government uh, and the Northern Ireland executive, east-west British government, Irish government. And then the range of problems that were there, prisoners, release of prisoners. There was never going to be a deal. Neither loyalists or Republicans were going to agree to a deal that didn't deal with the prisoners issue. So uh, the deal was we released all prisoners within two years on license. If they reoffend, they they serve the, their existing sentence and whatever new sentence they're in. The reform of the old police service, the RUC, into what is now PSNI, which is finally thought of. The decommission of arms, which took five years to, to resolve and setting up the International Commission on Decommissioning. Uh, the parity of esteem, which kind of equaled the quality legislation which was removing all the draconian legislation that had been on the statute book in the North. People always say for the last, for the previous 25 years, but most of it was on since 1920, since the Government of Ireland Act of 1920. So um, the demilitarization of the North, the soldiers back to barracks, the taking down of the watchtowers, there were these huge watchtowers right across the border. So whenever anyone went North to South, South to North, they were picked up, you're picked up in your car, your conversation was picked up. Uh, they were also watching the uh, helicopters, uh, watching over the border county. So all of those issues were taken um, and fairly well resolved. I mean, the, the one area of the Good Friday Agreement uh, that that has been a disappointment is the stop-start nature of the institutions. The fact that because everything is based on cross-community consent, meaning that everybody has to agree, um, if, if somebody gets out the wrong side of the bed, they can bring down the institutions. And that's what's happened three or four times. The British government brought it down once when we had this thing called Storm and Gate, which was a load of nonsense, um, turned out to be bogus. Um, uh, it was set up. Um, now we better not go into who set it up. We'll be here all night. But it was, it, 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 it was set, set up uh, later on then. Um, Sinn Féin brought it down over cash for ash, which again had nothing really to do uh, with the Good Friday Agreement, and then it was brought down over Brexit. I suppose moving quickly, uh, Chairman, because you're probably telling me time is nearly up, Brexit has been just a disaster. You know my view on Brexit, you've heard me enough at times, it was a stupid thing for the British people to do. Uh, that's my view, if they have a different view, that's, they're entitled to that. Um, but they re regret it for a long time to come. Uh, and they are regretting it, I think, every day. It's good to see that a lot of them are changed their attitude. Um, I, I think it, it, it happened because uh, Cameron made two fundamental mistakes and not happen, and not putting in having a referendum as one of those, but he rushed it. He had another year to wait and he could have waited and that would have given, I think, public opinion a chance to take a, a very different view. Uh, and the second issue that... Uh, he, he didn't get a, a real campaign going within his his party. Uh, and Corbyn, of course, was a disaster. Corbyn made one speech in, in favour uh, or against uh, Brexit in the whole campaign. And Labour should have been fighting the issues, the social justice issues uh, and, and all of the issues. But Corbyn w was really anti-Europe anyway. Uh, and in, in, in my view, was useless in every way. But anyway, um, he'd probably say the same about me. So, uh, so... And um, there we there, there 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 we go. We have to deal with Brexit and all the current issues that we've had, all the stuff that you've had to listen to in the period you do remember in your life uh, about the about the backstop and the the protocol, uh, and now the Windsor Agreement. All have came out of Brexit. Uh, if it wasn't for Brexit, we wouldn't have got any of that stuff. It, I think the island of Ireland and politically where we had cross-community support down here and cross-party support, we didn't have to any longer talk about border checkpoints or, you know, uh, items coming into the north and, and where, they, where they're going to want to the south. So all of these complications all arose out, out of Brexit and all the instability that we've had in the last seven years has come out of Brexit. Uh, it's caused us a, a nightmare uh, in lots of ways. Hopefully we'll get through it. Um, and now, just in the last few sentences, where we are now, um, I'm still hopeful, hopeful, uh, it's always difficult in the North that even though the DUP will vote against um, uh, the Windsor Agreement uh, today or tomorrow, um, I still think there's room to resolve the, these issues. They're, they, the, 
the issue is this, it's a bit stupid, but many of you here are good minds. Um, there's still about 3%. Well, one side say three, the other say five, but anyway, so let's say five. There's still about 5% uh, of legislation or uh, acts that will come into Northern Ireland that will be still European. Um, the DUP don't want anything to do with Europe coming directly from Europe to the North. They would be happy if they're codified through EU law or EU legislation. Um, uh, my own view, I'm not across every last line of detail of this, though I do take a, a, a close eye on it. I do think it's worth doing that and trying to see if there's a solution to that. Um, because if you don't, we're into the, the issue uh, that 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 director general here and I would would not want to be going down the the road of joint authority, uh, um, or um, the joint authority won't be accepted by the British, and 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 we're not going to accept that uh, you're going to have direct rule again. So it, you get into an awful mess, and we'd all be at each other's throats again for the next ten years. So I think it's far better they try and resolve this around the Windsor Agreement. Um, I, I was in London last week. I was up north for a few days last week. Rishi Sunak um, has put a lot of effort into this. He's put a huge amount of effort. Uh, Boris was a disaster, as you all know. Um, but, but Rishi Sunak has genuinely worked really, really hard to find a solution. Uh, and I think it, it would be terrible if we turn him off uh, and if the loyalists and unions turn him off. There's a lot of effort being made as late as a few hours ago um, to try and see if they can find a way of codifying uh, these laws uh, through the UK rather than directly from Brussels to Northern Ireland. The argument is, is, is simple enough from a union's point of view, um, as has been described by me by Jeffrey Donaldson. And just giving you what he says, he said it is entirely unreasonable um, for the Stormont executive uh, to to have to deal with issues where they have nobody in Brussels, where it's total diktat from Brussels and that they have no say, and that is put on top of them. Uh, the storm and break, um, uh, he says, is useless. Uh, I half agree with him on that, because the storm and break won't really work. It'll be used as a veto. Uh, and even if Geoffrey Donaldson was Deputy First Minister, he didn't want to change the storm and break. But it, it, Jim Allister and some of the extremes would be saying, oh, pull out the executive because you, you're not getting your way. So um, he, he has a point, and, and I think that has to be hopefully dealt with in the next few weeks. If we get over that, this word you all want to hear, this is where we get over all of the history of that. Northern Ireland is in a brilliant position. As I've said, it's the best trick or trick um, that it will have worked. Northern Ireland will have the island economy. Uh, they'll have the UK economy, um, and they'll have the Euro European connection. I mean, it is an extraordinary, there's several analysis being done by several companies. Some of you might be stock markets or uh, uh, um, stock broken companies or accountancy companies, but they're, they're, uh, IBEC have done very good work on this. Chamber of Commerce of Ireland have done good work. All show the major benefits for Northern Ireland and for the island economy, but particularly for Northern Ireland. Joe Biden, when he gets here, if this stuff is sorted out, you know, has already committed himself uh, to putting a Kennedy in charge of an economic uh, movement to try and get more investment to the north. So it couldn't be better for the north. Um, um, and you'd say, well, sure, surely they must all see that, but we still have to deal with the old identity issue. Um, and, and, and I met a loyalist group recently, and you know, I, I just relayed what they said. One of the leaders and one of the senior former paramilitary said to me, he said, Bertie, but you know, I know you guys are trying, but you have to remember, you know, jobs, investment, innovation, you know, new factory buildings. But that doesn't help my Britishness. I'm British. My father was British. My mother was British. My grandfather was British. That means more to me. So you're not going to sell to me a great economy and jobs for the future to take away my Britishness. And, you know, all you can do is look at them and say cheers. But, but you know, it, 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 it it, I'm just giving you the alternative view, uh, and, and we have to understand that alternative view. Um, but the Good Friday Agreement is that you can be British, you can be Irish, you can be both. Uh, but uh, anything 
anything that dilutes the Britishness, they have a fear. And so have a lot of the politicians. So a lot of the politicians who we disagree with in the union side have that fear. And they, they think that the border pole and they think it's all a trick and they think, you know, Sinn Féin will come into power and, you know, that, that they, they'll be caught on, on, on all of this. And so you have to go through all these scenarios. By the way, I think most of it is all rubbish, but you, you have to, I'm giving you the viewpoint of people who passionately believe in it. Um, uh, I, I don't think that's the way the future is going to work out. But if, if it's handled right, uh, and if we can make the progress, I think Northern Ireland can really flourish and it will help the Ireland of Ireland. It'll help our image abroad. Um, I, I offered David Trimble 25 years ago, this very week, that we would amalgamate the IDA and invest Northern Ireland as we did with the tourist boards. Uh, he, he, he saw the sense of it, but couldn't couldn't do it because he couldn't sell it to, to, to his unionist party at that stage, the ultra unionist party. So there, you know, there, there are these difficulties, but if we were to, if we were to move on from where we are now successfully, I think the Northern Ireland will dramatically expand and grow in employment terms. They'll stop the brain drain out of it to towards the graduates uh, for Northern Ireland still uh, emigrate and um, emigrate for college. Uh, and then they'll come back, uh, which is a huge loss to, to, to Northern Ireland. Uh, so I, I think if we can deal with these issues, it will have a great future. So, Chairman, that all is in the mouthful. How many, how long did that take? About, about 20 minutes, so you weren't too bad. <laughs> now, we'll take questions. Brilliant. Thank you so Thank much, you for Thank you. <clears throat>